In this video, we're going to start to take a look at operating system interactions by seeing how we can output data onto the screen. So we're finally going to do like an actual formal hello world program where we output hello world onto the screen. And while we're doing this, we're going to explore the ideas of system calls and system interrupts done through our assembly. So let's go ahead and get started. For the purposes of these videos, I'm going to be working through our Raspberry Pi. In this case, I'm actually logged onto a physical machine, but you can use the emulator we set up in the previous video, or you can use a physical machine of any kind that has an ARM processor if you want to follow along on something physical. Uh, the choice is really yours. It should work on pretty much any ARM-based device. So we're going to start off by creating a new file, which I'm going to call Hello World. I'm going to do that through the nano text editor. And it's just my text editor of preference. You can use whatever you prefer. The extension for this file is .s. .s is the typical file extension for assembly-based programs. And what we're going to do here is we're going to set up our program in a very similar way to what we have done in the emulator past, right? So let's take a look at how we set that up. We say .global underscore start, and then we have our start label. And then for this, we're going to need some data. And the data is going to be what we actually want to print onto the screen. And we're going to do that declared as a message. Now we want this message to be text. There's a lot of different ways that we can declare text in ARM, and I want to discuss each of them now. The most basic type of text type is ASCII. ASCII is just general characters. And there's something about the ASCII format that doesn't really work well for a lot of text applications. And that is the fact that it is not null terminated. And what that means is basically in some lower level programming languages, if you've programmed in C, you'll be familiar with this idea. When we create a string, since it's really just like an array of characters, we have something that indicates the end of the array of characters. Because of course, as we're going into memory, in memory, it's not always predictable what an empty slot of memory will contain. So what we do is we pick a special character that indicates the end of a string, and we call that the null terminator. So it's a special character set aside that always indicates the end of a string. The ASCII format does not have that. So this sort of format works best for things like individual characters or situations where we don't need the null terminator. In almost every single case, though, you're going to want to have a null terminator for your string. So instead, we're going to use this here, ASCII Z, I'll call it. And what this does is it declares a string, but it adds on a null terminator at the end, which allows us to know where the end of the string actually is. Now, one other note that I want to make here is sometimes you might see dot string. Dot string is actually an alias for dot ASCII Z. So that dot string is the same as this declaration here. So I just want to note that just in case you ever see dot string, it's the same as this dot ASCII Z. So those are the same as each other. It's a null terminated string. And then from here, we could just type in the name or what, what text we want, right? So I could say, hello world. I'm going to put backslash n. We could put this new line character in. So all that does is it indicates a new line, backslash n. And essentially, we can add that in because it will get interpreted through the operating system to write a new line character. So that's something that we're able to put in as well. Now, I will eventually show you what this looks like in memory. But for now, we're just going to sort of take this for granted and say, OK, this will work and we will continue on with this. Now, one other thing that I want to note is that when you when you make the call to write data to the screen in this case, which is what we're going to be doing, we're actually using components of the Linux operating system, which is a really interesting sort of idea. So you'll see that from this point on, when we start using these system interrupts and system calls, there's going to be a lot of parallels between assembly and C. So if you're familiar with C, it will be very helpful for you. If you're not familiar with C, not to worry. Uh, we will eventually discuss C and its concepts um, in future videos as well. So once we've declared the text here, what we could do is we could declare the length of the text. So I could say len equals dot minus message. What this is going to do is it's going to declare a variable called len, and it's going to be equal to the length of message. This is the way that we declare that. The way that this works is it starts at the beginning of the text. So it starts at this h character here, and it continues moving through it until it reaches that null terminator that I mentioned previously. Once it reaches that null terminator, it knows it's reached the end of the string. That is the length, and it stores the length in this len variable for us to use. So that is all the data that we're going to need to create our Hello World program. 
Now, in order for Hello World to work, in order for us to write data to the screen, we're going to need to declare and have ready three different pieces of information. The first piece of information is where do we want to write the message or text or data to? The second thing that we need is a reference to tell us what, want, what we want to actually output. And the third thing we want is the length. How long is the thing that we want to output? And those are all going to be stored in very specific locations. So we're going to move into R0, the value 1. This one indicates that we want to place uh, that we want to place the output in the standard output for our computer. So this would be the standard output, which is where all things output by default. In the case of me being SSH'd into my actual computer, the standard output would typically be the command line interface. So that'd be where that would output. So this is gen generally the way that we output things into the standard output. We can output to standard in by using zero as our argument. We can output to standard error using two as our input. Now in general, we can also add in different values other than zero, one, and two. This will actually take in any valid file descriptor as a, an argument. So we can actually write to files as well. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with the Linux operating system, in the background, what Linux does is it assigns things called file descriptors to the files on the system. What happens is when you open up a file, we are given a unique identifier for that file, which is typically represented, I believe, as an integer. And that allows us to know where we're reading and writing from. So whenever we make calls to read and write to files, we use this file descriptor, which is an integer, which uniquely identifies the file. Because this R0 is taking in some integer value, we can actually provide it with any file descriptor of a file on our system, and it will actually write to that file. So that's something that's interesting about this. Now, like I said before, we also have to give it the value that we want to print as well as the length. So we can do that using LDR. So I can LDR into R1 the message. So that's going to load the address of message like we've discussed previously into R1. So I'll tell it where message is currently located in memory. So it's kind of like a buffer, right? It tells it the buffer location of the message. And then what we could do is we can uh, LDR into R2, the value of length. This places the length into register two. So now we know the length of the actual string itself. We know the actual string that we want to print and we know where we want to print it. The last thing we need to do is tell the computer to print the thing to the screen. Now, the way that we do this is actually quite interesting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move into R7, the value 4. Now, that might seem a little bit random. What's happening here is when we communicate with the operating system, R7 is a special register that actually keeps track of what we want the operating system to do. So when we do an interrupt, which will allow the operating system to take over the processing, what the operating system is going to do is it's first going to look at register R7, and it's going to check what number is written there. That's going to tell the operating system what it needs to do next. When I give it the value 4, what the operating system sees is it sees that I want to write something to this screen. It's then going to take a look at R0, R1, and R2 to answer the questions of where to write the data, what data needs to be written, and what the length of that data is. It will then write out the data, and then it will return back to the program to allow it to continue executing. That's the general flow of what happens when we do this sort of interrupt. If we want to go into a little bit more detail, what's actually happening here is in Linux, there's a system call called write. What this is doing is it's actually calling that write function. And again, if you have familiarity with C programming and specifically like system level C programming, you are likely familiar with the write function. You use that actually to write files on a Linux system. That's the same function that's being called here. We're just calling it through a system call in a little bit more of an abstract way. So I just want to bring out that parallel just in case you're familiar with C programming because it's a really valuable one to keep in mind uh, that we are actually able to communicate with the system calls in this way. So we, we've set up the value that is needed in order to know which system call to make. Now we have to make the system call, which we do using SWI0. SWI means software interrupt. So what it does is it interrupts and it tells the operating system, hey, we need you to do something. The operating system helps us handle hardware things like input and output, so it is able to do the output for us. Again, it takes a look at R7, it sees the value 4, it says that's an output, it then outputs based on R1, R0, R1, and R2's values. 
Once that is done, it returns back to our program and lets our program continue to execute. At this point, what's going to happen is we're going to flow into the data and weird things are going to happen. In order to prevent that, we have to properly tell our program to exit, which hasn't been something that we've really had to do throughout the emulation type videos. To do that, what we do is we say move into R7, the value one, and then we do an SWI. So what's happening here is, again, we're telling the operating system what we need it to do. The argument of one is telling the operating system to terminate our program. So this time when we do our software interrupt, the operating system will interrupt, it will take a look at R7, it sees one, and it says, oh, that means I should terminate the program, and it will terminate it, and we will be done. So this is everything that's involved in creating our simple Hello World program. You can see it's it's not necessarily all that simple, but uh, now that you have a familiarity with a lot of the general concepts of assembly, hopefully this does actually seem a little bit easy to actually do, right? So a lot of these instructions are already familiar. There's a few new ones, a few new concepts, but uh, this should be relatively straightforward, hopefully. Now, the last thing that I need to show you here is how to actually run your program. We're gonna do two steps. We're gonna first assemble the program. So we're gonna do as hello world.s hyphen o, hello world.o. This is creating an intermediary for it file known as an object file. The object file can then be combined with other object files if required and compiled into what is called a binary. The binary is what is actually run on the system to execute the code. So to create the binary, we do ld hello world.o hyphen o hello world. So you can see right now we have three files. We have hello world, which is the binary I just created, hello world.o, which is the object file, and then hello world.s, which is our assembly code. Now we want to execute hello world, we do dot slash hello world. And as you can see, hello world is printed to the screen. So it looks like everything is working as expected. So from this video, you should now have a better understanding of how system calls work and how we're actually able to output data onto the screen. So thank you for watching this video. In the next video, I'm actually going to walk through GDB to show you how you can get a better understanding of the actual layout of memory on this Linux system, because you can't really see a lot of the details just running it. I want to show you how to debug and understand the code that you're running with a little bit better than what we have now. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.